All right, you guys ready? Bear with me. Um, so I thought I'd just give a quick presentation about um, some of the things that we're doing with Rails and Ember.js. Is anybody familiar with Ember.js? How many people have heard of Ember.js? Okay, good. How many people have actually tried to use it at all? Played with it? Okay. Has anybody used Backbone? Is anybody actually deploying Backbone or JavaScript MVC, anything like that? Using Knockout? Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. What's that? Okay, yeah, it's, it's actually very similar. So um, Ember.js is just the new hot one. Um, I think it's, uh, I've kind of played with some of the other ones. I really like Ember.js for a lot of reasons, but um, I'm not, I don't want to get too deep in the weeds about what Ember.js is and what it does. I just kind of want to describe kind of how, how we've kind of come to this um, conclusion about how we're doing stuff. And like I said, I've only been doing Rails for a year now, so I'm not going to pretend to stand up here and say that I know the right way to do JavaScript in Rails. I think part of the problem is there really is no right way to do it. Like Rails has very predefined ways about this is how you do your models and your views and your controllers, everything on the server side, but at the client side it's like, well, you're kind of up to your, you know, to your own creativity and your own imagination about how to do it. Um, if anybody has any better ideas, I would love to see a presentation about it. Um, but this is just kind of what, kind of where we've gone in our cycle. Um, just a brief history. I work at IOSTA. We're hiring. We supported the pizza. So, um, uh, so I have been working there since 2000, and I wrote the first line of code. We've been at it for like 12 years now. And 2000 was a very different type of place, but it's also very similar because the browsers sucked. And it's back then they sucked even more than they do today. It was back in the day with IE4 and Netscape 4, and they were at war with each other, and it was terrible. So we just decided, you know what, everybody else is doing this. It kind of looks like the hot thing. Screw it. We are not gonna, we're not going to play that game. We're just going to build a server-side application and a client-side Windows application and just deal with it. And by, by doing that, we did it in Delphi, um, which was great for quite a long time. Um, but kind of along the way, you know, what we were able to do is just really build some good solid design patterns on both the client and the server. We are able to just have a standard communication language, which we use XML for just all communication to and from the server. Um, we were able to share the common libraries from the client and the server, and the result was we were just really able to get stuff out the door, really come to market pretty quickly, without having to deal with just these ridiculous browser bugs. Um, so right now we're starting to work on a new product. Um, we've kind of we've done things over the course of the years, but this is kind of an official, pretty big project that we're going to be working on. Obviously, at this point in the game, it's it's got to be browser-based. That's the whole point um, of pretty much doing any client-facing application nowadays. It needs to work on mobile, zero deploy for clients, and we really need to have a complete server-side API. We're an enterprise kind of company, and so we really need enterprises to be able to communicate with our software really well. Um, as we all know, Rails is really great on the server. Everybody loves Ruby, strong MVC, huge community. We don't really need to go into that too much, um, but Rails is awesome. But the client is a cluster job. We have been struggling with it, and we struggled with it for a year. Um, what, I guess a little backstory. I mean, we, what we want to do is we're building this thing, we're building this application. We want it to stand the test of time. And so what we want to do is build something that is a little bit more interactive. It's for sure a little bit more of the web 2.0, 3.0 style thing. We really want it to be really interactive and um, therefore we want to have a lot of the more client side JavaScript, a lot of more Ajax stuff, kind of just feeling a little bit more like an application. Um, and we really struggle with that with with Rails and the, the way that we had originally tried to do some stuff. So I mean, we tried Backbone and we kind of had to throw that away. But um, anyway, so as far as the client goes, you know, from what I can tell with Rails, like it's fine if you're doing just apps and minimal JavaScript, you know, the views with ERB or Haml get the job done. If you're doing light Ajax, they've got some theories and takes on how to do it, and it's pretty good, it's decent, but beyond that, if you really try to do something that is very client-centric, I believe you're screwed. And that's only my opinion. Maybe we just have not figured out the right way to do it, like I said, but um, I've, I've, we found it very hard to just be able to organize our JavaScript files properly, 
you know, trying to figure out whether the AJAX should return HTML or JSON. And I think, I feel like with what we've tried with, um, with just the standard approaches that, that Rails provides, like it really is, well, you just need to provide AJAX, or you need to do AJAX requests that provide HTML snippets that you just then insert into the DOM, and we found that to be really cumbersome. Um, so I, I really feel like there's kind of this unholy relationship between the client and the server where everything is really coupled. Like you've got, you've got some HTML happening, being sent from the server, and some HTML being jacked with the client through J, you know, jQuery and all that kind of stuff. And there's really just a, what I felt to be a pretty difficult separation of concerns when we're trying to do this stuff. Everything was just felt a little too coupled and just a little too confusing for us. Um, so one of the questions that we just had to ask ourselves is why, why is it that we have to accept the fact that the server can have some awesome MVC style things and great code patterns and everything, but the client code is just doomed to suck. Um, so what we decided, you know what, screw it again. We're going to let the server be the server. We're going to have it just be um, just a data API. It can handle all the data persistence. It can handle any, you know, any validation, any sort of you know, emailing and other logic and stuff like that. But we're going to really let the client be the client, which means that its job is to, is to render the display to the client of the data. Um, and so we decided, well, let's just look into building an in-browser client application completely and have the server deliver 100% JavaScript and no HTML at all. What is that going to take to get that done? Um, and we actually really found it to be pretty, pretty, uh, pretty cool with EmberJS. And by doing this, then we have the API for free that our enterprise clients are going to need. So on the server, we've got Rails. We've got, obviously, the typical MVC patterns and our RESTful routes. Um, instead of the views rendering HTML, the views just render JSON. Uh, right now, we're using JSON Builder, but you can use kind of any of those um, any of those other ones. JBuilder is now official with Rails 3.2, so we'll probably be going with that eventually. Um, and we just kissed ERB and Hamel goodbye. We just don't need it anymore. And on the client, we have EmberJS. And EmberJS is a real MVC platform for the client, where um, we use what's called handlebar templates to generate HTML. They're just like mustache templates, and um, you know, it's just a way to generate HTML on the client and have it be rendered in the DOM. Um, we're using RESTful client-side routing, so basically, you know, our routes, when somebody clicks a link, it will actually go to a route that looks like a standard route and can be bookmarked and can be, you know, emailed to people and all that stuff, but it really is a client-side route. You can tell by the hash. Um, and the application just knows how to deal with it. Um, and then our models are server aware, so we can just call, we can change a property called model.save and have it send it up to the server all asynchronously. Um, so in this really quick example, uh, I just thought, let's just make a controller of books. Um, so I've got, you know, on a server you create a simple book model, you create a simple controller, and, um, and a view to render the JSON, and the result might look something like that. Just a simple array of data for books.index. On the client, we have, um, we do kind of the same thing. We have an MVC pattern, so we have a book, which I'm, we're using CoffeeScript for, so we have a book model, and you can define all sorts of properties in there. I just wanted to keep this really short, but, um, so you can define a property there, um, you can define your controller that basically here, all this is doing is it's setting a property of books on the controller to getting all of the books from the server. And that happens totally asynchronously. It just gets the job done. And then it renders the index, which is basically the page that gets rendered. So, and then we've got the view, which, um, which just can obviously do a lot of things. The, the views are pretty cool. It's not just a template. It's a template plus some code behind it, which is kind of something a little bit different than what Rails does. Really, with Rails, your views are a template, and that's all they are. With Ember, you kind of have views, but you have them backed with some, with some JavaScript code that you can do some other really cool things that views should be able to do. 
without having to rely on a controller or a model to do it. Um, so we have a view that just, at this point, just, just, dis, just specifies what the template name is. And then here's a really simple handlebars template that just, um, it just iterates through the, the book's collection, the array, and then it just outputs the title and the author, and that's it. And as a result of that, the HTML will render out that, you know, exactly what you would think it would. Um, so Ember.js, I really think it's pretty awesome. Um, there's a lot of really cool things that it does besides just the MVC framework. Um, it's, got, it's got what they call bindings, automatic bindings. And so if you take a look at this form, you see that, um, that the title has just a text field, and that value is binding to the book.title. And that basically means that it's a text field that will come out as an input uh, type equals text. And as I type, the actual content of that, that model will change, that title will change automatically. I don't have to do some sort of on submit of a form to go in and render JSON and parse the values out from the text field and all that kind of stuff. It just does it. Um, and then you can see that the Ember button, all I'm doing is just calling the save action on the model. And so really you display that form, you edit it, you click the button, and it automatically sends it to the server and you know brings back the results. All in a great restful way of doing things. Um, another really great thing that it has is the ability to create a computed property. So on a model, for instance, you can have something um, you can just define another property. I just have something silly here where it just, uh, anytime the title property changes, which you can see in that, um, that property title, anytime that changes, I want to um, determine if is lame is true or not. I want to evaluate that, and it is true if the title contains the word twilight. So, so at that point, I can say, Model dot is lame or book is dot is lame and it will come back as true or false by virtue of the fact that the title property is what it is and any time that title property changes that is lame property will be re reevaluated and it also has an observer which is kind of like a property but instead it's really just a method that executes an action based upon a property changing so um, I just have a silly function here that um, it just checks to see if is lame is modified, and any time is lame is modified, it will execute that action that just throws an alert if the, if the book is lame, if the is lame property is true. Um, and you can see that even that observes property, like it is based on a computed property, so it really allows some really cool method chaining, really uh, this great ability to just be able to, to make the data the way that you want the data to be, make your models what you want them to be, your controllers what you want them to be, and your views what you want them to be. So in conclusion, Ember and Rails is pretty awesome. I know that was really quick. I wanted to just kind of blow through some stuff. I don't really have any other examples or code to show just because there's a lot to talk about in a lightning talk. So that's as far as I got. Um, I'm actually going to be presenting at, um, at the Indie.js meeting, presumably next month. That's what I'm currently scheduled. Uh, at which point I'll go into a little bit further detail about Ember.js and what it does and building a true client-side application with Ember.js. It'll be a nice long talk, hopefully, you know, 45 minutes or an hour or so. Yeah. Uh, your API runs, are they shallow or are they nested? They can be nested. Okay. Yeah. And then your resources are aware of those, or basically aware of their own route. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I mean, there's, there's a... Uh, there's for sure an extent, like Ember is still very new. Um, it provides the capability to do those kinds of things, but we definitely have our own layer of stuff that so kind of, that helps support that as well. I don't know, I don't know what the term, a shallow route is, or what was the other term? Like Just nested. Like nesting of resources there. Okay. Yeah, so book slash one slash author yeah. slash. So we're, sh we're shallow. Uh, like in Rails, uh, you can specify, I believe, on resources if you want them to be shallow as well, which will then bring them down to the root. Uh, so if I had like uh, book down author, I guess, uh, mm -hmm. and I said I want author to be shallow, I can just go author and specify okay. the ID. It makes it a lot easier when you just want to just go slash author instead of trying to find the route all the way. Okay. Gotcha. 
Did you look at uh, Meteor at all by any chance? <laughs> I looked at the demo for Meteor. Does anybody else check that out? It's it's compelling. Have you looked at it at all? Yeah, I kind of deleted everything from all of their demo sites and replaced it with, you guys should really add some security. Because <laughs> it's, it's really neat. It's so it, it's a, your same, your JavaScript code runs on the server and on the client. Yeah, Node.js. Uh, and it's Node.js and it's Mongo. And so there's a lot of cool stuff you can do, but it exposes most of the Mongo API directly to the client. <laughs> So you can go in and do whatever you want, drop collections, delete other people's data. Like, it's way worse than SQL injection in terms of the power that you give people. Right. Uh, it's pretty awesome, and they <laughs> <laughs> and they don't seem to care. Like, security is not in their next milestone. It's planned for the future. So, very cool. Like, things update automatically. You can go into the console and and run code and see what it does. Like, very slick. Um, you can use handlebars, or they have a couple other template things you can do, but I don't know why anybody would ever build an app in it, just because trying to lock it down would be an endless nightmare. Yeah. Well, well, what you do is you use the Ruby gem, and you just snapshot your data, and you just <laughs> hang on to that somewhere that is not, um, uh, how should you put it, uh, insecure. Uh, and then when people inevitably were destroy your data, you just go back to the last Put the save data there. back yeah. up and, yeah. and load it so back up again. It's just an ultra new way of thinking of totally trusting the server. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody made a... So there was a sticky notes demo, hopefully just by random chance it wasn't somebody in here that wrote that, but I, I went to the demo and wrote a little script in the JavaScript console that would just add sticky notes to the app until there were so many that it took it longer to sync with the server than the sync timeout. And so, I mean, your browser was just hosed at that point. Like, I had a lot of fun with it, but not in a nice way. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, it's, it's compelling. I mean, anybody wants to see a demo of something really cool, the Meteor demo is pretty awesome. Um, you know, obviously with this, it's Rails, so, you know, it's, it's the security is on the server, and it's up to yeah. you to implement it properly. Yeah, it seems like Meteor is, you know, this concept of, can we do a real app in the client? Yeah. And then they took it all yeah. the way. Yeah. And maybe it shouldn't go quite that far. Yeah. Yeah. Layers layers are meant to be there for a reason. Yeah. Do we find any browser issues with Ember? Like you say a new enterprise, so is IE a problem? Or <laughs> <laughs> I mean, is IE ever a problem for anybody? Um, yeah. Uh, I think we decided, you know what? Um, Ember.js is supposedly supposed to work on IE 6 and above. Um, uh, we found that to be true, however, i6 and i7 are terrible to develop with regardless of Ember.js or not. So we've actually decided, you know what, it's, it's causing way too much friction for us to support those and every day that goes by people are, people are moving off of them. So we're supporting IE8 and above and Firefox, Chrome, and Safari. So. And that seems to be going really well for us able to keep everything pretty well standards compliant and CSS it just seems to render everything the way that you would expect it to so we have that luxury knowing that you know it's still going to be a little while before we have anything out the door and, um, and by that you know it'll be kind of still to a limited audience at that point so. do you uh, route your API through a subdomain or uh, uh, sub-library like slash API versus API dot uh, right? Are you talking on the server? Yeah. The server, the whole thing is the API. So everything is just JSON. Okay. Yeah. Any call that you make is JSON. How are you versioning your API? Uh, we are not right now. <laughs> we don't need to. Um, you think that? Obviously. I do. <laughs> yeah. Two years ago when I said that. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, all right. Let's talk afterwards because <laughs> I really have no idea what we're going to do about that yet. It's, we're still a little ways from release, so um, it's not a thing that we have to worry about yet, but definitely something we have to think about. Right, it's not yet, but like a month after you release the yeah. next version, you're like, oh, damn it. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Then you're an expensive versioning tool. Gotcha. Do you have any suggestions? Space models. Pick something and do it. Yeah. Nice. Have you done it as well? Yeah. We named space our models. Um, or, or sorry, our API controllers. So we usually go we go slash API slash v1 slash whatever the controller's gonna be. Gotcha. 
Um, and then we usually have a conversion number set up within JavaScript to specify which API we're using. Cool. Um, that's kind of just the guesswork we've done. We haven't done any research to see if it's going to hold up. But at least we have some room to kind of move around. Ask what you should really use if we do it for your version numbers. <laughs> so, uh, so it could be like one version. Just pull a just pull a Texas method and use digits of five. <laughs> so text is currently at version three point one four one five nine two six. <laughs> but they don't plan. I mean, they don't, they release you know a new version like maybe every five years or something like that. So they are not planning to have to extend to many more digits. So does any? I'll just ask the question myself. Does anybody have any other good ways of dealing with JavaScript and Rails? I really have been liking XJS. Yeah. Using it. We love that we can just copy something and use it in Central Touch and throw up a mobile app. Mm -hmm. Relax. And they, it looks like they've been designing it for Rails. A lot of the, a lot of their API, they have a REST API that works in pretty well with Rails and stuff like that. So yeah, we've been using that. You say X. EXT? Yeah. So is this different from like XJS used to be sort of a JavaScript or a jQuery? Yeah, they changed it with 4. 4 is more like a full fledged application framework. They even added like class inheritance and yeah. spacing right in the Java. That was a little bit past three years or something like that. Yeah. yeah. I freaking hated it two years ago. I wanted it to die. It's got a learning curve. It, it does have a learning curve. And AmberJS definitely has a learning curve. Yeah. Wow, copy and paste. Sounds scary. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's one of those things. I mean, the the guys at Ember. It was it was based on loosely based on Sprout Core, which is just very similar to Ember JS. I think one of the one of the biggest differences between Ember JS and something like XJS is you can just embed it as another library in your HTML application, and the its whole point is just to allow you to build HTML templates, which is kind of not really what XJS and Sprout Core are about. They're all about creating a tree view control and throwing that on the form and having, you know, a list view and grids, like a very much more of a window style thing. And Ember.js is really, let's use just jQuery controls and let's just use everything else that, that the web and HTML5 have to offer. So what led you to throw out Backbone? Um, good question. Um, it's been a while, so I don't really remember, but... Um, I mean, I really think one of the big things was was that once we have the view, like what, like what do we what do we do with it? And I, I know we had a lot of trouble with with like when I wanted to save something, and I feel like when I when I wanted to save something, then I'd have to say something like I'd have to tell it render or don't render because sometimes I did not want it to render; it would just have adverse effects. It might have just been that I had no idea what I was doing with Backbone, but there were three guys we spent a good month trying to hammer with it and try to make it happen and it, as clean as we were able to make it it was still really cumbersome for us to to be able to tell it when to render and to render properly and with ember i mean it just happens there's no glue code at all like you just you bind up you bind a view to a model using a controller and it just does the job it's it's really great. They, I mean, they, what they really call it is it's your model is a single source of truth, and wherever you are in the application, that's when you're binding to it. That's what happens. You can change it, and wherever you happen to change it, it will change. And so you can have like four different views that all have the same property, and then one edit control for that same property. And as you type in that edit control, every the other controls just update. It just happens under the scenes. Matt Bean gave a talk at NEJS a couple months ago, and he uses Backbone and some other, another one as well to do, and so I can give you a contact with him if you're interested. And yeah, awesome. What he, what he does too, so he makes it a lot like Rails, he does you know, views, controllers, and models, and then he, um, so that's the, the website, but then he also uses Titanium to build it for mobile as well, so he's able to use the same JavaScript to, to do awesome. Very cool, yeah. Well, we're hoping to do that too. So. <laughs> Is there a way to test it? Uh, to test MRJS? Yeah, we use Jasmine. And it, yeah, it actually, it's, that's a good point. Um, so it turns out, like, at the end of the day, like, what we're running right now, we've done, like, code coverage reports, and we've done, like, you know, code line count and stuff, and it turns out that 5% of our code is Rails right now, is Ruby, and 95% is JavaScript, 
And uh, that's kind of the nature of the beast, I think, anyway. You know, you're just talking about the data persistence layer that really doesn't have a whole lot to do and versus the view that has a lot more stuff to do. Um, and so, yeah, we use Jasmine for everything. Um, it, it really works. It gets the job done really well for us. And it's nice because, you know, you have their classes. Everything is class-based. Your models are classes. Your views are classes. Your controllers are classes. You're really able to just test it all the way that you would normally test a Rails application using our spec. Any other questions? Bye. <laughs>